Hello and welcome to Pat Cooper workshop number four. I hope you've been having a fantastic uh, time and you've been able to catch up with any, all the events. But if not, feel free to check out the YouTube playlist on uh, at Pat Foundation on YouTube, where you can see all the previous events. So this is the penultimate workshop. It will be my last workshop, but there'll be one you can catch up from the singular team on Friday. Um, so the reason for, for these workshops is we're celebrating 10 years of PACT. PACT, the open source project, was started in 2013 uh, with the PACT broker coming to life in October 2013. Um, and we'd like to spread some uh, awareness and some little bits of knowledge about PACT from the PACT team. So this one will be a bit of a maintainer contributor workshop. Um, and hopefully we'll have a bit of demo time at the end. So, who am I? Uh, hi, I'm Yusuf Nabi. I uh, wear many hats. I'm a community shepherd at PACT. I'm also uh, where I get to work um, kind of uh, full time on the open source project. I'm also a developer advocate for PACTflow, the commercial uh, arm of PACT, uh, who were recently acquired by SmartBear. And I work for the developer relations team at SmartBear. So, I'm joined by Joe Lang, uh, our other community kind of. Uh, Shepherd, who's joined the flock from the Cucumber community, and she'll be hanging around on the um, Pat Foundation YouTube channel. So if you've got any questions, feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, this session is being recorded. It will be streamed on YouTube so you can catch up with it later. Uh, so our agenda today will be taking you through what the Pact framework, uh, what is the Pact framework? What does it consist of? Uh, what does the ecosystem look like? <clears throat> How do we distribute it to our users? Um, how you can get involved? And we'll take some Q&A at the end, but we'll also stop periodically uh, throughout to see if there's any questions. So it's a, it's a game of two halves. So what is the PAT framework anyway? So you might be familiar with this diagram at the top. We're kind of looking at uh, our scope. So our scope generally within a PAC test is a service to service communication. And we're interested in the message contents, uh, most likely the message schema, um, and potentially the transport mechanism as well. For message packed, we're uninterested in the transport mechanism. For regular packed, we'll just use HTTP as our transport mechanism. With packed plugins, we can extend that for additional transports or content types that the packed framework doesn't uh, doesn't support. And it is at its most simplest form, a consumer test is is performed in a unit testing framework utilizing the packed framework. And um, when a interaction has been successful, that will be written to a packed file. And that PAC file will be shared at some point later with a provider. And that provider will read the contents from the PAC file. And that will be replayed against the provider. And the provider will return a response. The PAC framework will then assert the uh, response of the provider versus the expectations in the PAC file and will return a result. So on the we, we said before it's a, a game of two halves. So the, the first half on the, the consumer side is using a mock provider. So a consumer would issue the, the request that it would make in a real world production scenario. But in lieu of um, talking to the real provider for, for various reasons, that provider may not be available yet or we may just want to simulate that provider in order to make our test repeatable. So we would issue requests to a mock provider and that mock provider would be uh, instantiated and provided to us by the PACT framework. So some instructions would be issued to the mock provider in order to set up the expected request that our consumer is going to issue and the state of the provider that we wish to return when that uh, correct client request is issued. 
And if all those uh, kind of elements are in play, the consumer issues the correct request, um, the provider returns its response, the consumer can perform its unit test assertions, and if those unit test assertions are okay, then the PACT framework will serialize the contract into a PACT file. Now, a point to note from a maintainer's perspective is as long as the mock provider has been issued with the correct request, the mock provider would have no mismatches and therefore will be eligible to write those PACT files, th those interactions to a PACT contract. So within a, uh, a user's unit testing framework, there would normally be assertion guards on the system under test. So for example, um, this consumer piece of the application that's issuing this get users one, two, three request, there would be um, assertions based on the, the response of that function. And if the, those expectations are incorrect, the test that unit testing framework will fail and uh, in doing so, we probably wouldn't, uh, the, the PAC framework won't, due to the, the lifecycle setup, um, write that PAC file. So once a consumer test has been performed and this PAC file has been written, on the provider side, the provider gets the contract in some way. So initially, when you're starting out, um, because consumer-driven contract testing uh, or contract testing in general is not a replacement for um, conversation and collaboration, you need to, in order to kind of close the loop, you need a provider to verify these contracts. So you need to share that contract with the provider. And because no one likes surprises, um, you want to be able to ensure that they're set up in order to be able to, to verify this contract. So it's not just thrown over the fence. So they will utilize the PACT framework. And the PACT framework will be told where this PACT file lives. So you, in this scenario, we're just sharing the PACT file manually with our provider. So the, the second half of the PACT framework is this provider verification. So the provider verification will read information from a PACT file um, and will issue those requests by simulating a consumer. And it will replay those requests against a provider. The PACT framework will need to be told where your provider is running. Traditionally, this would be a local host, locally spun up a provider. It can be a um, deployed provider. Um, it's, it's configurable by the base URL. Um, however, there are complexities in using um, shared kind of stood up servers. So there are some considerations you might need to take when you're doing that. Um, the simulated consumer, which is provided by the PAT framework, is responsible for reading the request and replaying them to the provider. It may be responsible for reading things like provider states uh, from a PAT contract. And these provider states would be issued to the provider in order to provide a, uh, a provider lifecycle events to either set up some data before the test is performed or to tear down some data after the test has been performed. And once a provider has uh, been issued that request, it will provide its response. And the PACT framework here will perform assertions based on the expected response in the contract and the issued response from the provider. There are additional um, features in the contract that can be embedded. So things called matches. So they would allow uh, a contract example to use a stricter match. So here, for example, um, our example shows the object name and Mary. Um, and if our expectations were encoded in the contract in that simple terms, our provider would always be expected to return the key name um, and it would always expect to return the, the value Mary. We can use matches to, to loosen the expectations whereby our provider would only need to return the field name with a value uh, that is a uh, of, of a type string. 
An additional point to note is, despite the fact that this um, response expectation contains one field, a provider may return many more fields in their response. What the PACT framework here is just looking for is the expectations uh, a, a correct subset of the response provided from the provider. Cool. Um, so from a consumer scope perspective, the consumer scope is only interested in the part of the application that speaks to an external service. Um, we're not interested in any other parts of the, the application. Um, the collaborators function will normally abstract away the individual particular details of an external service um, away from the rest of your business logic in your application. So traditionally, you can write um, pack tests as soon as you have written your collaborating service, and that may be before you've actually written the, the rest of your application. So it can really help guide your development um, and is ideally mostly suited to, to uh, a unit testing uh, phase with a development team or a embedded kind of development and testing team. And from the provider scope, uh, we mentioned before that we would, um, the PACT framework is responsible on the provider side for issuing requests to the provider. And the, uh, the user who is authoring that test is responsible for starting up the provider, uh, having a URL that the provider is available on, and providing that URL to the PACT framework so the PACT framework understands where to issue the requests. We advise um, spinning up as much of your application as possible. Um, you may need to mock out uh, external services um, and you may choose to uh, replace um, databases with uh, shared databases, say, for example, with databases you can control. So you might spin up a, a full database for end-to-end -end purposes, or you might use a, an in-memory database. Um, they're traditionally used so you can control the, the state of your application. So you can, um, say, for example, if a consumer is going to issue you the same request, so a request to get a product, they may expect a, a scenario where a product doesn't exist and a scenario where a product does exist. Being able to utilize things like provider states, we mentioned before, allows the ability for providers to, to set up and tear down state. This would, provider states would afford a provider the ability to, um, instantiate that in memory database with the provided state in order to fulfill a specific test. Um, so once you've got these particular contracts, you need a mechanism to, um, sorry, let me rewind a bit. So in our scenario for um, creating a simple packed file, this packed file has been generated from a consumer test. The packed file has been manually shared with a provider, and then the provider is able to verify that. So that works great for a single point in time. However, one of the great advantages of contract testing is it allows our services to evolve gracefully over time. And the way we can do that is by generating contract tests on every single version of our code. So this um, enables us to do something called version coordination or whatever type of term that you want to kind of refer to it to. So for example, in this top left, we, um, on a particular commit, on a particular branch, we have run our unit tests, which contain some packed tests, and a packed contract has been generated. We can share that contract with our provider, and our provider can verify that contract. And again, that contract has to be verified against a, a point in time. So that provider might choose to verify that code base against this um, 
main branch. Now, at that point, the provider verification might be green. So we, oh, excuse me. So we know that the consumer and provider are compatible. So what happens then if the consumer makes a new change to their code base? That new change to the code base may or may not um, cause a change to the API contract. It may be a simple UI change from somewhere else in the application, or it may be a change within that uh, collaborator. So once you make that change, being able to, to regenerate those packed files by rerunning your unit tests allows you to get a new snapshot of the contract at that new point in time. And again, they can be verified against a provider's point in time. So here we might choose the, the provider's main branch. And then we may come along and make a, a third change. And this, and this third change on our consumer is now going to be a change within our collaborator. We're going to say, request a new field that our provider doesn't yet provide. We've spoken to our provider and we've agreed that we, are, we need this new field. Um, so we're gonna work, go away and you know, code that on the consumer side. But we need to know when it's safe to deploy. So if we share that contract with our provider um, and our provider verifies that against their main branch, we would want to get the feedback that the expectations from the consumer are not met by our provider. So you need, it, it's ideal once you have these packed files um, to generate them from every change on your consumer code base and verify them against your provider. Now, one of the best ways to do that is with a PACT broker. Now, you can use PACT without a PACT broker. We actually recommend it, especially if you're getting started. You can actually ex exchange these PACTs via any mechanism you like. Um, you know, you could do it via email, Slack, whatever. Um, there are actually some additional um, tooling out there not built by the, the core PACT team. Um, that say, for example, use uh, S3 as a uh, version store. Um, however, much of the uh, benefits of, there are many great benefits of utilizing a packed broker uh, and they've been realized over the, the 10 years of utilizing the packed framework, generating these packed files and needing a mechanism to um, share them. Um, so PACT on its own allows you to create and verify these single contracts. Um, PACT and the PACT broker would allow you to integrate the contract testing into your CI CD pipeline. Um, the, the PACT broker itself, it ensures that your um, contract tests will pass successfully um, before deploying a particular version of your code into an environment. And we can do that by using the PACT Can I Deploy tool, which is a, a standalone uh, tool written in Ruby um, that users can use to determine, if we just go back one page, um, almost present a matrix of these versions and their compa compatibility results so they can be queried at any time. Um, it affords the ability to use webhooks and these webhooks allow whenever um, a consumer pact changes. Um, so every time a consumer change is being uh, run in CI CD, if the contents of that packed file change, we're able to trigger a provider verification. And by triggering that provider verification via a webhook, we can kind of sit and pull on our consumer side and then call can I deploy, um, ensuring that we kind of close this loop in an automated fashion. And if there is a discrepancy between those contracts, we're alerted at the earliest point and not post deploying our application. It affords us the ability to use backwards compatibility between our services. 
so we can understand where our breaks are occurring in our services and we can potentially apply patterns such as expand and contract in order to allow and coordinate our releases so actually our releases can be deployed independently without downtime it may be the case that can i deploy and using these features actually issues you uh, puts you in a scenario where your code would be incompatible for a period of time but actually this period of time is within a service window so you may choose to um kind of know that your applications are not compatible until this chicken and egg situation of maybe deploying a, a provider build and um, so you don't need to go through the additional steps of expanding contract so pat uh the pact and pact broker with its versioning matrix, uh, the ability to use um, branches and environments to denote where your applications and which versions exist at any time. And using the can I deploy tool can give you real actionable insight into uh, raising your confidence as to when you want to deploy. Um, you can use break, there's also break glass mechanisms built into the can I deploy tooling. Uh, so that you can just use it as a confidence uh, tool um, and you can actually choose to uh, make a make a decision based on other information you have in your um, ecosystem to maybe uh, ignore that result. So the, the choice is, is yours. Um, Pact and the, PAC, the combination of Pact and Pact Broker just provides this actionable insight. Um, so we'll just stop for a moment and see if there's any questions. Oh. Uh, if there are any questions at any time, feel free to throw them up in the YouTube channel. If not, feel free just to catch up with the book, catch up with any of us on Slack at any time. So what does the patch framework include? So the PACT framework uh, kind of starts off with a specification. Um, so if you're familiar with something like Open API as a way of uh, describing RESTful services, um, the Open API uh, specification um, or JSON schema specification, for example, provides a, a set of guidelines um, that can uh, define, or oh, let me try and think of a good way to explain this. Um, they, they provide a definition for a particular format. So uh, in our case, it's JSON, um, or could be uh, YAML, which is a superset of JSON, um, defines the, the properties that a shape of object in JSON needs to adhere to in order to be called a certain thing. So for an open API specification, if your JSON schema matches these, uh, if if the shape of that JSON matches certain properties, it can be uh, said to adhere to an open API specification. And there are particular versions of these specifications which either denote different changes or additional features. So PACT is very similar to that, if you're familiar with any other um, connotation of specifications in your computing world, very, very similar, exactly the same. So we've got this um, version one to version four of these PACT specifications. You can check them out at the github.com PACT hyphen foundation forward slash PACT hyphen specification. Oops, said that right, PAT Foundation for slash PAT specification. Um, and you can check out the individual branches where you can see the changes uh, that were introduced within each version. Also recently, uh, one of our engineers uh, um, in the PAT flow team, Voon, has been working hard on creating some PAT schemas, uh, which cover versions one to four. We're very grateful in the past uh, for a gentleman called Ben Sayers, I believe, from uh, Atlassian, who uh, originally built some JSON schemas for version one, two, two. Um, so you can check out all these particular versions here. Uh, version 
two was the most widely used by all of the languages, regardless of the core implementation. Version three, um, the main highlight was it introduced a pack format for message queues um, uh, and allowed for provider states with parameters rather than just a singular provider state. Um, and version four, the big standout highlights were the ability to uh, cater for packed plugins. So arbitrary transports and content types. And it also allowed the ability to store different interaction file interaction types in a single packed file, which was a limitation that was introduced in version three when we introduced message queues. Um, different languages are at different versions uh, of specification support. And of those different specifications, they are at different parity of implementation, uh, different parity of completeness. Um, so you'll see further on in this presentation, some of the work that the core team have been doing in order to try and um, help us kind of work out uh, feature support for all the languages. Um, so we do have a feature support table on our pat.docs.pat.io website. You can check it out at forward slash roadmap, forward slash feature underscore support, or you can check out, I think it's pat, uh docs in the header and then go down to feature support. Um, so there's a raft of features provided by PACT. Um, so kind of the high level stuff, HTTP PACT, the two different types of message packs and packed plugins. And then there's various different uh, kind of features. So we've got matches, um, we've got the different packed specifications, we've got provider states, we've got the ability to um, publish and retrieve packs from a pack broker. Um, and then we've got additional features such as pending packs, work in progress packs. And then there are um, some kind of additional language specific stuff um, and they might uh, contain stuff like uh, provider uh, request filters and other types of things. If you look at this page, uh, I've, I've only taken a snippet of it, it contains kind of columns for each of the languages and kind of a yes no as to whether or not that language supports it. Um, that might not be that useful for end users because each of the different languages are on different versions and those different versions might have different feature support. And sometimes the versions of the PAC specification overlap with the version of the specific client language. So um, we are trying to work hard uh, on some ways to make this a bit more visible. If there's any ways we can try, if you've got any ideas, feel free to, to reach out because we're we're definitely you end users are the most um kind of our ideal target audience for this. Um so language implementations. So PAC has a, a great advantage of we we mentioned about these PAC specifications. So these PAC specifications are, are language agnostic. Um, and the beauty of them being language agnostic is, as we've seen the, the rise of uh, microservices or the interest in contract testing, um, regardless of which particular programming language you are uh, using, um, you may be, uh, you, you'll have the ability to do API REST calls, for example, or you might be, uh, one of the advantages of working in a microservice architecture is each of the components in your microservice architecture could be built in a different language. So if you have the ability to share contracts um, in a language agnostic manner and can use the same framework across multiple languages, this is kind of the one of the payload kind of grounds. Um, so the packed um framework exists in multiple language implementations today. We've got uh, JavaScript, JVM, Golang, Ruby, CE.NET. Uh, you can use it standalone. Via, <clears throat> you can use it standalone via Docker or a command line tool. We've got Kotlin, Scala, uh, don't know what that logo is, Python, 
um, and some other tools. You, you name it, it's potentially there. If it's <clears throat> if it's not there, you may be able to to build it yourself, and that's what we'll see as we get to near the end of this presentation. If you go to the docs.pack.io website and check out the uh, pack docs section, you'll be able to see each of the language implementations uh, on there. There are probably uh, community language implementations that are not on this website. If you built one and want to get it on the website, the website's open source. Please feel free to add it. If you don't know where to add it, reach out to me. Um, if you're just a community user and your favorite language uh, implementation isn't listed, feel free to reach out. Um, and again, it's language agnostic as well. Both um, core implementations are available as command line uh, command line applications as well. Um, to our current supported platforms, we aim to support Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And when Pact was initially uh, started in 2013, um, it was mainly x86, 64, um, so Intel processors, and in some cases, 32-bit. 32-bit um, processors have pretty much been phased out now, um, and there's been a big rise in ARM processors, both due to uh, things like Raspberry Pis, um, Apple Silicon, and cheaper um, kind of cloud uh, providers. So I know AWS have got Graviton uh, ARM processors available. So there's been a, a big upsurge in ARM processors. So um, ideally, we, as a patch reference implementations, would support Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and both support Intel x86-64 and ARM64. Um, so there are three uh, packed reference implementations. There's packed Ruby, which supports V1, uh, V1.1 and V2. There's packed JVM, which supports V1 to V4. Um, so just for some historical context, Pack Ruby was built in 2013. I believe Pack JVM was built around 2014 uh, by um, Ron uh, back in REA. And when Pack JavaScript was going to be written, I believe in 2015, there was a decision made to um, not create another core in order to avo avoid uh, language discrepancies. Um, due to um, some limitations with the Ruby core, most consumers have now migrated over to a Rust core. So where they might have once consumed the Ruby core, uh, they now consume the Rust core. I believe there's only one consumer, external consumer of the JVM, which is packed for us. Um, but I'm uh, happily uh, being mistaken on that. Um, we do have an ecosystems diagram. So if you go to doc.pack.io diagrams ecosystem, you can check out um, some Mermaid JS uh, diagrams of each of these particular ecosystems how they all connect together. Um, so PAT reference core, what, what am I talking about when I'm talking about the PAT reference or we're talking about the PAT core? So you mentioned right at the start, it was a game of two halves. So we mentioned like there's a mock provider and there's a, um, uh, a provider verifier on the provider side and this mock, mock provider on the consumer side. So in the Rust uh, core, we uh, for the mock provider, we have the packed mock service. So if you go into the packed mock service repo, it's available, it's a Ruby application, it's bundled up with, um, it's also available as a command line application. From the Rust side, uh, its counterpart is the packed mock server CLI. From the provider side, uh, for our Ruby core, we have the packed provider verifier. And on the Rust side, we have the packed verifier CLI. So you can go to either of these repos, you can uh, check out each of the CLI applications and you can contrast and compare. The uh, CLI tool on the left, the Ruby one, will only support up to V2. 
the one on the right will support up to v4 and is backwards compliant. Cool. So we'll just hold on and see if there's any questions. Let me just take a drink. So what is a packed core? So um, Beth often uh, jokes about the, the Ruby Goldberg machine, and this is a, a drawing by a famous cartoon artist called Rube Goldberg, who often makes uh, overly elaborate um, overly elaborate inventions for uh, simple everyday tasks. So here he is on his way to post a letter. Uh, so we we quite like this as a as a um, reference to our ecosystem as it is quite large and and needs a bit of cognitive load to kind of keep it all in your head. Um, so why why do we have these core ecosystems? So I mentioned um, back when we had the the Pat Ruby and Pat JVM, I think there were some issues with discrepancies between the the two implementations for end users and the services were no longer just being like pure Ruby services or pure JVM services, they were beginning to need to talk to, together and they were needing to talk together uh, via these patch contracts and discrepancies between the implementations were causing issues and confusion. So when Pat.js came, uh, JavaScript was becoming quite popular um, around 2015, and they were wanting to uh, also introduce contract testing uh, to the mix. Um, we decided that the uh, a decision was made to wrap the Ruby implementation. So it was actually packaged as standalone executable. So this was mainly done to avoid the maintenance burden and, and avoid the potential of implementation mis mismatches. It became the pattern that was used for most of the packed implementations. There are some outliers that are either natively implemented in their own languages, and that's totally fine. Um, but for the most part, uh, the most of the core languages are implementing um, this this Ruby core pattern, this Ruby core. Um, and each of the languages implemented a, a packed DSL. So a domain specific uh, language, which was idiomatic to the particular client language you were using. And as we said before, the game of two halves, it was this mock service on the consumer side and the uh, provider verifier on the uh, provider side. And they would call out to the Ruby mock service um, as a command line application in the background. And anyone who's dealt with uh, kind of sub processes and process management in a particular native language, it's a bit clunky and difficult. Um, so, uh, so they were some of the limitations as to why eventually we moved away from the the Ruby runtime. So, what does a packed Ruby kind of uh, makeup look like? So we mentioned before on the consumer side, pack mock service, so we've got the pack mock service here. So actually similar to microservices, the packed, uh, the packed gem itself is actually built up of, of smaller components. So each of these components is dealing with an individual concern. So the pack support kind of has shared functions that are shared between all of these. We have the pack mock service, which we mentioned before, packed uh, provider verifier, which sits on the provider side, and packed. Uh, although packed Ruby doesn't officially support V3, there was rudimentary support for packed message um, via uh, packed message. Um, just got a question, which I'll take for TN. Um, hello. Uh, do I know why packed JVM doesn't reuse the packed Rust core? So I think this is due to limitations of uh, the JVM engine. Um, no, I don't think it will do. There is, um, so the Pack JVM core, I believe there's some limitations in being able to, to use native interop, especially when it was developed, um, possibly due to the, the fact that it compiles down into bytecode and is executed in the Java virtual machine. I have separately seen the Java team are working on a project called Project Panama, I believe, and that allows an alternative mechanism for native interop. 
So essentially, there's a way of providing your header file and dynamic library to the Panama framework, and it kind of spits out uh, generated bindings. And you can use these generated, bind generated bindings with something called uh, JNI, Java Native Interface. There's a few different mechanisms. Um, but Ron, uh, if we ask in Libpack to FFI, Ron will definitely be able to go into the fuller history as to um, Pat JVM's rationale for still retaining an individual core. Um, but yeah, there is definitely mechanisms for uh, utilizing the, the ROS FFI shared library in there. Um, have been exploring it in a separate repo. It is quite cool. I don't know if we do it officially, um, but yeah, food for thought. Um, cool. So uh, we've just got a pack task here on the, the left hand side. So this is generally how people in the Ruby framework would use um, pack, but we want a mechanism for people outside of the, the Ruby framework to use it. So there was something called the Traveling Ruby project. And the Traveling Ruby project was built by a team called Fusion in the Netherlands, and it provided a Ruby runtime um, and provided a mechanism for you to take the gems that you've built. So all of our packed uh, framework that was written in Ruby, and it packages a Ruby runtime because Ruby is an interpreted language. And um, so you need a, a Ruby runtime in order to execute those instructions. And it bundles them up into this nice little backpack. So this image is taken from the Traveling Ruby website. Um, so there's some languages that still use the Traveling Ruby runtime. So for example, Pact PHP and Pact Python. Um, and they use the, the Pact Ruby core for everything. Um, there is a V10 alpha branch of Pact PHP that TNVO has been working on that will utilize the Pact reference, uh, Pact Rust core via the FFI and Pact Python. Um, there's rudimentary support being added um, by uh, Josh Ellis, um, who's our newest maintainer to the Pact Python team, and he's a full time member of the Pact flow team. Uh, so there's some uh, limitations with the Pact Traveling Ruby framework. One of the biggest ones was the Ruby runtime is uh, was on Ruby 2.4. So if you were to go to the, the Ruby end of life website, you'll see that Ruby 2.4 was end of life some years ago. And um, we mentioned earlier that the supported platforms that we were looking to, to cover these days um, are Windows, Mac OS and Linux. Um, but the traveling Ruby runtime only supported Intel. And with the prevalence of uh, ARM, we needed ARM versions at least for Linux and Mac OS. So the combination of a, an out of date Ruby runtime and the, the lack of support for ARM was less than preferable. So um, just as an aside, uh, I did some work uh, where are we now 2023 maybe this year i can't remember they all meld into one um but i did some work on the traveling ruby runtime so we've been man man managed to extend it to the latest ruby runtime which is ruby 3.2.2 and we've also been able to extend it to cover mac os arm and linux arm so this is a great bonus for some of the existing languages that are still on the Pact Ruby runtime. There's a bit of an interim while we're moving over to the Rust core, um, but also it's a nice way to kind of pay back to the, the Ruby community um, and the traveling Ruby team for uh, the, the success that we've been able to leverage off the back of using that traveling Ruby runtime. So we're very grateful. Um, for that, because it's enabled us to, to bring PAC to, to many different languages. Um, so the, the Ruby Goldberg machine is a, a little bit complex. Um, there's a, a bit of a, a matrix that spins off in CI when any of these things are, are released. So when we saw our PAC Ruby slide and all the gems that make that up, um, essentially they're at the, the top side of this uh, graph. And all of those are bundled together um, into a packed Ruby standalone package. So that takes this traveling Ruby runtime, 
it takes all the the pack gems so that's what we say a pack ruby core is everything that's above this pack ruby standalone um and then that pack ruby standalone was consumed by many different languages uh and i've tried to put on here the different versions of languages that um the core support so for example packed php and packed python are still using um the packed ruby standalone packed go for versions v1 and below are using the ruby standalone but we'll see later that actually packed go on v2 is now using uh the packed rust core if you want to check out this diagram you can go on to docs.pack.io diagrams ecosystem you can check it out um uh, so packed rust um so why do we move to rust so we kind of the same thing we could take our crates and we could take all that sweet packed functionality and we could really easily make executables um so these command line applications and they were loads smaller than the ruby runtime and we were able to target more platforms far more easily so prior to me making uh the the traveling ruby runtime work on an arm that wasn't a possibility, whereas it was a possibility with Rust. And the ability to create command line applications or shared libraries with Rust is part of its kind of standard library. Whereas for Ruby, we're relying on these third party tools. So the fact that this is, is natively supported by its language is just a, a very preferable thing. There was the potential um, of choosing Go at the time. However, uh, just due to personal preferences <laughs> from um, the original author, Ron, who worked on the, the Rust framework, um, he doesn't really like Go. Um, so I think that was the, the, the rationale. It, it could have been either. And you could still, uh, if you wanted to, essentially implement the, the PAC framework natively in Go or actually any other language. Um, however, um, in the interest of working smart and not harder, you could just reuse all this great functionality that's already built. Um, so if you go on to cargo.rs possibly, um, whatever the Rust um, website is, uh, you can search for Pact on there and you can check out all the different crates. Um, so rather than gems in the Ruby world, they're crates in the Rust world, you can check out all the different crates that are available to you. So for example, we have things like the Pact Mock Server CLI, so from the consumer side, and we've got the Pact Verifier CLI on the provider side, but they're also available as crates within Rust. Um, so Rust consumers can use them, but they're also available in something else, another distribution method called an FFI. Um, and Pact Rust out the box supports uh, Mac OS, Linux, Windows, it supports um, the Intel assemblies and also supports ARM. If you go on to the PAC uh, reference website, um, PAC Foundation forward slash PAC reference, you can check out the LibPAC FFI release where you can see all the different versions that are available to you. Um, so there's two types of client usage in PAC Rust. There's a command line interface, it's language agnostic. And this was a traditional way that Ruby use uh, client languages would utilize the packed ruby core via command line and sub processes um, the most preferable way if a client language supports it now is to use a foreign function <coughs> excuse me a foreign function interface and this foreign function interface requires native bindings into client languages so it'll allow a client language to call the uh, functionality and this functionality is stored in a shared library rather than being called via command line and it provides better process management versus having to uh, control sub processes um, there's a rust goldberg machine that you can check out on the diagrams ecosystem website um, for most uh, end users, the entry point is going to be the, the packed FFI. So a lot of this stuff above is, is really just for um, interest if you want to check it out. On the diagrams ecosystem, there are all, 
there are links as well to each of the cargo tunnels. So the cargo tunnel for each of these files will define which of the uh, dependencies are contained within here. And you'll be able to see how, say, for example, each of these components all share the pack matching crate. This is similar to the pack Ruby core, whereby everything in the pack Ruby core relied on a pack support uh, gem. So they kind of provide some core functionality. And then in here, we've also denoted the different languages and the versions in which they began to support uh, packed FFI. So um, it, I can see straight away that it'd be great to get packed PHP on here uh, with version 10 alpha and packed Python uh, soon. So I might leave that up to our viewers. Um, so we mentioned before about the packed features. It's very difficult to work out um, how the packed features, um, what packed features are there, how to um, update that when it changes, um, and how to accurately describe these in a language agnostic, uh, a, a client language agnostic manner but in a mechanism whereby they can be tested in each client language. So we elected to use a Cucumber and a kind of BDD approach to describing the V1 to V4 features. You can check it out in the Pat Foundation Patch Compatibility Suite. There is some implemented cases in the Pat reference for Rust. There's one for Pat JVM. Um, if you're curious, you don't want to build a language, it's a really cool place to, to start, maybe just look at some of them that are implemented and maybe go through and trying to implement um, some of these yourself. And um, if not, let just have a have a look and see see what it feels like and let us know. That feedback's always welcome. Um, so I'm going to pause for questions, but I'm actually just going to read through because we've only got five minutes. So what is an FFI? So what is it? Very naively, it's a way of calling native code from a higher level language. Um, you can check out the wiki page to search for foreign function interface. It's got some really good links and descriptions. Uh, jakegolding.com forward slash rust hyphen FFI hyphen omnibus. Oh, uh, it's also a really good um, kind of nice visual representation of seeing rust, a, a rust library compiled into a shared library and then consumed in various different languages. So how do the FFI, uh, how do we communicate? So how does your client language communicate with its uh, this FFI package? So programming languages need to interact with the C functions via C data types and primitives. Um, you need to check your specific language documentation. Um, search, like if you're using Dart, search for Dart FFI or Dart native interop. It will show you how to load a shared library, and it will also show you the details on the C data type mappings. So there's different C types. So here we can see void, intate, uint, different types of numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, these will normally be mapped into some kind of native type on your client language side, the details of which vary um, depending on the client language. I've been working on uh, trying to load the packed FFI in as many different languages as I can, and um, not necessarily implementing all the, the packed client language functionality. Um, so if you're stuck, feel free, just reach out to us, give us a shout. Cool, so how do you load it? So uh, Rust will compile the FFI. Um, so all that functionality in those kind of crates that we saw in the Rust Goldberg diagram into a shared library. This is basically a single file, and this single file will have a different extension per platform. Um, so it will be called libpact underscore FFI dot extension, um, except for Windows, obviously, which uses packed underscore FFI. Um, on Linux, the files are called dot SO for the extension, um, and this is a dynamic linked library. Uh, so if you do LDD and then provide the name to the library, you'll be able to see all the different files that this library dynamically requires in order to do its job. Um, there are slightly fatter binaries um, called static binaries that end in the .a prefix. 
and they are self-contained and um, they're a lot bigger um, on mac os the dynamic libraries are called dot dy lib and they can also be called dot a for the static um, and then on windows there is a dot dll uh, prefix for dynamic link library um, and how do you actually load it uh, depending on your particular language um, you would tell you you find your FFI function um, and you tell your FFI function where your shared library lives. So here, when you build the shared library, it builds into the Ross target debug folder. Um, and depending on your uh, client language, you may need to provide something called header definitions. Um, so what's in this header definition file and what's actually in the shared library. So if you look at the shared library itself, the dylib or .so file, it's a binary file, so it's not easy to look into unless you have a hex disassembler. I wouldn't recommend it unless you enjoy binary. Um, alternatively, you can look at a packed header file. So a packed.h file is provided with each release. And it contains a list of all the functions, arguments, and return values that are available in that shared library. Um, they're also available on the docs.rs website. So if you just search for packed FFI docs.rs, you'll be able to find that. Um, but in here, it contains all the different functions and how you call them. So it's kind of the Bible to your FFI. Um, how do you use it? So you grab, uh, like, let's take a function here. So we've got packed FFI underscore new underscore pack. This takes a uh, two arguments. We have a const char consumer name and a const char provider name. Um, these are pointers to a location that contains the name. Um, depending on your diff each language, you may need to do different stuff here. Um, PHP, which we're showing in the example, you can just pass a string and PHP does some auto magic in the back. Um, in some cases, you need to create a, a const char um, with a pointer and provide that pointer value here. And the different details might vary slightly on your particular language, um, but feel free to, to reach out if you get stuck. Um, so there's a return value that's mentioned here, it's a packed handle. Um, so this packed handle, we will grab as our return value. When we call this packed FFI new packed function, and we're going to use this handle now to refer to our new pact between these two consumers, uh, consumer and provider. This is kind of the same format you'll do for the composition of any one or number of functions in this shared library to do your, uh, to do whatever function, Fun, um, do whatever scenario it is you're performing. Um, so just a word of warning, um, I, I'm aware we've gone slightly over time. I'm probably going to carry on for about, I've got four slides left, um, and we might do a quick demo. So uh, I will probably carry on for maybe 10 minutes. Um, so one word of warning, uh, Rust is memory safe. Um, compiling into a shared library and using it via an FFI boundary is inherently unsafe. Um, so I know people talk about Rust being better than C in many ways. Your compiler will shout at you and kind of make sure you're doing sensible things. However, when you utilize things across an FFI boundary, you can get into bother um, quickly if you're not aware of some of the underlying uh, kind of memory management things. Um, feel free to reach out if you get stuck on that uh, in libpact FFI users in Slack. Um, generally, for uh, convenience, we've provided some cl cleanup functions. Um, so one of the kind of things in C is you have to allocate memory before you use it. You have to allocate the right amount of memory so you don't do things like buffer overflow and you ideally need to garbage collect. Well, you do need to garbage collect your, your memory after, otherwise you have memory leaks. So the packed FFI provides some cleanup functions uh, for memory management. So I've just pulled out a couple here. We've got packed FFI string delete. So some of the methods will ask you to uh, return a string delete method because you will 
um, create some data in the Rust world and you need a pointer to access it in your client language, but the Rust world doesn't know when to delete it because it doesn't know when you're done with it. So you need to explicitly tell the, the, the patched FFI framework to unallocate that memory by calling string delete. Um, if you're using the provider side verification, um, you'll call packed FFI verifier shutdown and provide it a verifier handle, and that will shut down all the available resources. Um, and on the consumer side, it's clean up mock server, and that will clean up all the, the resources on the consumer side. Um, there's a bit of a, a helping hand. So C uses pointers to memory locations to reference where the data is stored. Um, so pointers are passed around the FFI boundary to tell each language where to find the data it creates. So if you're writing data to like your hard drive, your hard drive has got pointers to wherever the, the data lives on that um, hard drive. And if like you format your hard drive, you might delete the pointers that point to that data on the hard drive. Now the data on the hard drive still lives there, but you just don't have the correct pointers that tell you where it lives. And if you actually get the incorrect pointer, you get some other data on that disk. So this is why if you do something like a, a regular format of your hard drive, you, um, if you, uh, delete your pointers on your hard drive, you can recover your data back by using kind of data recovery tools. If you write all your, if you zero your hard drive, basically you're overwriting all the contents of this memory. So when you write back to the point, you read the same pointer again, that data doesn't exist. Um, these pointers are kind of hard to, to deal with um, or maybe hard to deal with. So PACT masks these. Um, with things called handles or opaque pointers. Um, so these opaque pointers will return a consecutive integer to the calling language rather than returning the memory pointer. Um, and then the packed FFI library itself will track in a lookup the consecutive integer and the actual pointer location. So uh, I've pulled out some of these here. So, for example, when you create a new pact, you get a pact handle. When you create an interaction, you need to provide uh, your pact handle to creating a new interaction. And um, you'll get returned an interaction handle. If you look at that interaction handle, that first interaction handle, I believe, will be numbered one. If you then create a second interaction, that interaction handle will be number two. Um, and then you can reference those individual interaction handles in order to set up individual details. So like the with response or with contents, et cetera, for specific handles. Um, this is a, when we mentioned before about the process management, I believe this makes it a little bit easier to deal with multiple mock services and uh, multiple mock services that are running on different ports, whereas that was a bit of a difficulty for running concurrent, especially consumer tests on the consumer side. Um, so let's build the FFI. So I'm gonna do a quick, demo in a minute, but I'll just tell you how you can get involved and uh, how you can help. So how could you help? You could build out uh, one of the compatibility suites. So take a look at the compatibility suite uh, repo, take a look at the PAC reference and PAC JVM repos that have compatibility suites. Um, maybe see if you want to uh, implement one of those compatibility suites or even just implement a test within there, within your favorite PAC implementation, that'd be awesome. Um, you could create a language um, either on your own or with a friend or on a client project. Uh, we've seen um, loads of uh, kind of uh, projects been built. I know uh, Priyan built one for Pact Elixir, possibly, it might be Erlang. 
Um, it's in our docs pack blog where you can check it out. And OTN's been working on the pack PHP. Um, you can try it out, blog, vlog about it, provide feedback via GitHub issue or check us out on Slack. And you can amplify the message to your networks if you've lo- used or loved Pact. Please spread the word. So I'm just in the, the Pact uh, repo um, at the moment. Um, so I've dropped into the, uh, this is the Pact reference repository. Um, so I can get that by doing a, a git clone at pat foundation pat reference if i drop into the um if you cd into the rust and a uh, pat ffi folder you can run uh, a tool called c bind gen and c bind gen will create a um that that particular header file for you so we mentioned before the header file so this will tell us all the different um functions that are available to us um so that particular command is c bind gen uh you press it the, the config you tell it the crate and you tell it to output your include pack.h file um you can check out all this in our uh release scripts um there's a release ios release linux that they basically run for all these steps if you want to check them out for yourself and um, you can just drop into any of these particular folders in the pack rust um in the packed uh rust subfolder so here we've dropped into packed ffi and we're going to do cargo build i'm on a uh mac os machine um uh, and it's an arm 64. so my particular library has now been built in the debug folder, and I can see a lib pack ffi.dy lib. You just take a look at that file. Uh, you can see here that it's a dynamically linked shared library and it's for ARM64. If we just check with OTIL what's inside it. And we can see that it's linked to a few of our system libraries. So this is our shared library that contains all of our different files, uh, different functions, and all the, the packed core functionality, and the new packed core functionality in Rust. And then we've got this packed H file that defines where it lives. Um, outside of the, the Rust folder, there are some examples of native interop in different languages. Just going to take a look at the PHP one. So there's a consumer one PHP. In this consumer one PHP, uh, we showed before that we need to import a packed file, uh, a packed header file, depending on the framework, and we need to import our shared library. So here's where we're referencing that shared library we've just built. It's a dylib here. It would be so if you're on Linux, or it would be dll if you're on Windows. And then we can call the various composition uh, functions we need to. So this particular one is going to do a consumer test. So going to run this test now. So we can see here that some various functionality was accessed from the, the patent. Um, with the the packed ffi framework and we generated a packed file off the back of it um and i'm not really able to show you much detail on here but this actual packed file though it's not um it's only uh, 120 lines long um and it's been able to to execute a kind of full full pack test so and although this isn't how the language might not be uh, used explicitly. If you want to see how it is actually going to be used in, in PAC PHP, you can check out the PAC PHP project in the FFI branch. Um, but I really like the uh, ability just to kind of build the FFI locally on your machine. Um, so say, for example, if you wanted to, to hack around and change anything in the Rust core, you can build any of these libraries really easy with Cargo, and you can start playing around with them in a particular language. 
that's it. The one last thing that I might share, I've still got the slides, is So we mentioned before that the um, shared libraries, uh, once we built that shared library, it's available to us in multiple different languages. Um, there's a few different languages that you'll know uh, and be using today, but there's a lot that we don't currently cover. So any library that can um, read uh, a shared library would probably be eligible for building um, a, a packed client language implementation or this is a uh, my particular repo so it's git uh, github usaf forward slash hello underscore ffi and here you can check out loads of different languages uh, some don't have um, packed implementations today so if you just want to see pack basically uh, the the pack shared library being loaded up in a language that isn't supported today but you see your language in the list maybe that's a bit of a leg up to get you started so I'm going to stop sharing now. I appreciate anyone who's stayed on. And, uh, oh, in fact, let's just stop sharing this screen quickly. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for attending all of the, the packed workshops. And um, for anyone who did attend, especially Tian, I know you've been at every single one. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. If you catch up with these on YouTube, uh, uh, I hope you enjoy them. Please feel free to drop into the Pat's Slack channel and just give us some feedback and let us know how you get on. And hopefully I will actually try and do a more hands-on workshop. Uh, I just thought a lot of this kind of background information would probably be uh, useful. If there are particular workshops you want to see or particular workshop requests, Again, just feel free to, to reach out with us. If you'd love to, to work with us and collaborating um, in presenting uh, a workshop live, feel free, because it's not just to preserve of us, we want to be able to provide a platform for you all as well. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and we'll uh, see you at the next Pactober workshop. So you can check that out at one o'clock on Friday the 27th, I believe, where you can check out Singular introducing the Pack JVM DSL uh, that should make it a bit nicer for you to create packed objects um, and interactions in Java world. So until next time, thank you very much.